this I will try to explain to you how it is possible to verify the correct execution of a computation without re-executing. Of course, just so a, a computation is in this sense a fixed procedure that runs on a certain input and, and results in a certain output. And the, the computation itself is, is deterministic, so whenever you run it on the same input, you always get the same output. And um, of course, the obvious way to do that is to just run the program again. And uh, that is what is currently done in blockchains. If you sync a blockchain, you just rerun all the computation that the miners have already done. I mean, you don't rerun the search that is done in mining, but you rerun uh, uh, executing the transactions. And um, on the horizon, there, is, uh, there are new research results which might allow you to do some things which then result in uh, checking a computation and being reasonably sure that it's correct faster than re-executing them. Okay, and uh, as an outline of this talk, I will start with uh, explaining why that might be uh, useful for blockchains. I already started a little on that. And um, then there are, yeah, basically two popular approaches to that problem. Uh, one of them is called SNARK, and the other one is called Stark. And they share some uh, properties, and, they, and in some other regards, they are uh, fundamentally different. And since there were already talks about snarks, I will focus on starks for the rest of the talk. And um, yeah, I'll try to explain how they work. And the first component of starks are uh, running the computation and generating something that is called a computation trace. And this is then encoded into a polynomial. And the second component is something called IOPP, Interactive Oracle Proof of Proximity. The first two are already bored. <laughs> Can I understand that? Um, and this is used for low degree testing. And then in the end, we'll see how you can add zero knowledge to the whole thing. Uh, I am in no way responsible for any of the results uh, explained here. And this is a long yeah, line of research that started in the 90s. And the names here are just some of the contributors. And I already warn you that I will leave out some details, uh, quite a lot actually. Uh, but I hope it's still, you can still see the, the yeah, main breakthrough ideas there. And I yeah, already have warned you that it might be a little dry. So if you have any questions in between, please ask to, to uh, yeah, make it a bit, a bit less dry. Okay, um, where are you finding blockchain? Um, when you look at a blockchain, it always starts with a block with a number zero, which contains the genesis state, which might be completely empty or contain some uh, pre-allocated funds. Um, and then you add a new block, and uh, this block number one then contains a list of transactions, and sometimes also something called a post state root. So this is, you, um, you take the, the state of the blockchain, so, so kind of the, the uh, account balances, and create a Merkle tree of it, and in, in the block or in the block header, you store the root hash of that Merkle tree. And now, assuming we have this technology and it is practical, this Stark technology, this verifying computations without re-executing them or faster than re-executing them, then we might be able to attach a proof to that block which uh, can convince a verifier that the uh, transition from the genesis state to the state in block one by the given transactions was done correctly, so that this post-state root is the post-state root you actually get when you run the transactions. And, but we assume that it's possible to verify this proof without actually re-executing the transactions, without actually finding out the effect of the transactions. And so if this block comes in and you want to verify it, you just run the proof. You don't uh, 
re-execute the transactions. And this is a little boring, but it gets more exciting when we add block number two. This block number two looks similar. It also has transactions, and it also has a post state root. It also has a proof, but now the proof uh, does not only prove that the transactions uh, took the state from the state in block number one to the state in block number two, but it also um, proves that the verification of the proof in block number one was done correctly. Okay? So this proof does not prove that the uh, transition from genesis state to block number one was correct. It only proves that the proof in block number one was verified correctly. And that's a big, uh, big difference because especially as the blockchain grows, um, the amount of work that is required there stays the same. So we only verify the transition from block two to block three and the checking of the proof in block two. We don't verify the checking of the proof in block number one and the transition from zero to one. So what we only do is we have a proof that the state transition from the previous block to the current was correct and the previous proof is correct. And this means that um, syncing a blockchain, if we have the technology, then syncing a blockchain just means downloading the state and verifying the proof in the highest block. That's it. That's all you need to do. So you don't need to rerun all the previous transactions. So um, yeah, and to warn you, so this does not yet work in practice, and it does not solve the problem of data availability, and it does not solve, uh, yeah, you only know that the block that you have is correct. You don't know whether it's the highest or the one with the, with the most proof of work. So that, that's similar to data availability. So somewhere out there, so you might be disconnected from the network and the rest of the network might see a much longer chain and you're on the wrong uh, block. That's something you can't do here. You can only see that the block you have is correct and the whole history is correct. Okay, um, so that's what might be possible in the future. And now, uh, how, does, how do these yeah, computation verifiers work? Um, almost always those start with something that is called an interactive protocol. Um, in an interactive protocol, you always have two parties. One party, or yeah, you might also have more parties, but most of the time you have two parties. One of them is called a prover, and the other one is called a verifier. Um, the prover is usually much more powerful than the verifier. So think of that prover is someone who uh, creates a transaction, and the verifier is just a smart contract on the blockchain. So the prover has, uh, yeah, Tremendous amount of memory, tremendous amount of disk space, access to network, and the verifier is extremely limited. And they exchange messages. Prover sends a message to the verifier, verifier reads that message, answers with her own message, prover reads that message, again answers with her, with her own message, and so on. Um, and the verifier is allowed to use randoms. And uh, so on correct input, so think of it as for a fixed computation, input and output pair, and this, this is correct if the computation on that input yields that output. Uh, if that's the case, then the verifier has to accept after the exchange of messages. And on incorrect input, if the computation was wrong, then the verifier has to reject with high probability. So verifier uses randomness, so we have to say with, with high probability here and not with, with certainty. Okay, and you might already see that this is not really suitable for blockchains because I can't really exchange messages with blockchains. I mean, I can, but it would be a hassle because it takes multiple blocks and so on. And uh, because of that, uh, interactive protocols can often be made non-interactive by a technique called uh, or named after Fiat and Shamir. Uh, we might take a look at that later. Okay, and now, Let's compare snarks and starks. So just name the, uh, the acronym. Snarks is succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. 
and Starks is succinct transparent arguments of knowledge, although Starks are also non-interactive most of the time, but it doesn't really matter what these acronyms mean. Um, the thing is that the proof size. So proof size means the length of the exchanged messages, and usually when they are non-interactive, this means the prover just sends one single message to the verifier, the verifier processes this message and says, uh, I accept or I reject. And since it's just a single message, it's also called proof. For SNARKs, they are very short, so something like 188 bytes, um, mostly regardless of the size of the computation. And for Starks, they are longer, uh, currently in the range of 400 kilobytes, something like that. Um, snarks are not run once. This means snarks require a quite costly setup phase. But this setup phase uh, has, uh, only has to be done once for one type of computation. And then it's extremely fast. So you have to invest a little in the setup, and then you can repeat it multiple times. And for Starks, that's not the case. Uh, there's no setup. So uh, it's, in general, it's a little slower, but uh, you can do it multiple times on different functions. Uh, transparent, that's quite important. That means that um, for snarks, you need random numbers, and you need to keep them secret. So in this so-called trusted setup, the setup phase that you just do once in the beginning, random numbers are generated and they have to be kept secret or you have to be kept secret at all cost, but uh, they are not lead needed anymore later, so you can also destroy them. That's why you might have seen videos of people drilling holes in their computers and things like that. Um, for Starks, that's not the case. Anything that happens in Starks is public. So, of course, Starks can also have zero knowledge, but uh, so there are private parts, but you don't need this trusted setup. You don't need the, the toxic waste, the random numbers that you need to destroy. And snarks rely on some assumptions about cryptography. For example, that uh, elliptic curves are secure and also something like knowledge of exponent, um, which is in practice not true anymore once we have scalable uh, yeah, scalable actual quantum computers. So, um, because quantum computers can break elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, for Starks, that's also better because they only rely on the existence of collision resistant hash functions. And I think this is something that is reasonably true for, yeah, quite a long time. Okay. Um, both uh, technologies here and many others start with encoding computations as statements about the equality of polynomials. And um, this is, so encoding computations uh, as polynomials is quite useful because uh, you can easily check whether two polynomials are equal or not by evaluating on them on some points. And the reason is that if two polynomials are not equal, then they are different at almost all points. So uh, in the rest of the talk, we will always talk about polynomials over finite fields. And this means you can actually have numbers there. So uh, they are two different polynomials are only equal at a number of points that is equal to their degree and different in all other points of the fields. And uh, so, The problem is that we want to avoid uh, the prover having to send the full polynomial to the verifier because the polynomial is usually rather large and we want the messages to keep small because these messages are stuff that needs then to be encoded into the blockchain. Um, so the verifier wants to check that two polynomials the prover claims something about are equal and has to evaluate them for that but uh, she doesn't know the polynomial. So she kind of has to ask the prover to evaluate the polynomial for her and then check that the, the numbers are equal. But she has to kind of trust the prover that this ev evaluation was done correctly or the prover has to convince her that she did it correctly. And snarks and Stark 
take two different approaches there. SNARKs use partially homomorphic encryption for that. And um, it works by the prover evaluating the polynomial at an unknown point or an encrypted point. And this encrypted point is the thing that is generated during this trusted setup. So some randomness that is later destroyed is used to create a random but later secret point where the polynomials will be evaluated. And um, since, so this is homomorphic encryption, so if the, if the value at the encrypted point, which is the encryption of the value at the point, <laughs> So if those are different, then also the decrypted versions are different. And because of that, you can throw away the randomness. So you don't need the decrypted point anymore. You can just work with the encrypted point. Um, OK. And Starks are, don't use cryptography. They just use hash functions. Not sure if you count that as cryptography. And here. The rough idea is that the prover commits to the full evaluation of the polynomial. So they take the polynomial evaluated at all points in the field, or at least a, a large uh, number of points, and then create a Merkle tree of these function values and send the root hash to the verifier, just the root hash. And then the verifier can request the prover to send some values. And these values then, of course, come with uh, Merkle tree proofs. And the only flaw is that, uh, as I said earlier, the verifier has no control about how the prover actually evaluates this function. And because of that, we need a second component where the prover proves the verifier that this gigantic uh, array of values she has is actually the value set of a polynomial. And this is done in something called IOPP, Interactive Oracle Proof of Proximity. OK, so let's get into detail. Uh, what is a computation? Um, as I said, it starts with it starts with an Input, so um, let us simplify computations here rather strongly. And let's assume we have a computer that only has three registers. These registers are A1, A2, and A3. The input at the beginning of computation is present in these registers at step zero. This is one, four, and two. And then we have a fixed program um, that does something on these registers. So for example, at step one, we take the value of A2 and A3, add them, and store it in A3. And then at step two, we take the value at register two and register three, add them, and store that in register one. At step three, we take the value in register one and register two, multiply that, and store it in register three. And so on, uh, we do that for 8,000 steps. Of course, the program is not a list of 8,000 instructions, but it's somehow more compressed. So it has loops and, and things like that. So the, the description of the program is much shorter, but uh, at every step of the computation, you kind of know which uh, operation to perform on which registers. Um, OK, and uh, yeah, so we have an input of 142, and the prover claims that the output is 15.334. And uh, of course, the computation is correct if uh, it is correct at every single step. And the idea now is that verifying a single step is easy in comparison to running the whole thing. <coughs> and um, now, yeah, we wanted to encode that in polynomials. So what the prover does is she takes um, this sequence of values for A1 and turns that into a function. So the function a1 at point 0 is 1, a1 at point 1 is 1, a1 at point 2 is 10, a1 at point 3 is 40, and so on. These are 8,001 points. And 
Because of that, you can create a degree 8,000 polynomial that behaves exactly as that function at these points. So the polynomial at 0 is 1, the polynomial at 1 is 1, and so on. Degree 8,000 might, might sound a lot here, but yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, in the paper, uh, they actually go to degree, I think, 10 million or something like that. I mean, the number of steps of a computation. Um, yeah, and we do that with all three registers. And now, uh, there is another polynomial called C, and this kind of encodes the, the, the program. So, and it can be used to check the correctness of a single step in the following way. Okay, so this is the first uh, complicated formula. I'm sorry about that. Um, so the computation is correct if and only if the inputs and the outputs are correct. So that's something we have to check in addition. And I mean, output is correct does, here does not mean that output and all the preceding stuff is correct, but just the output. And in addition to that, for all x in between 0 and 8,000, so these steps, we run C, or we evaluate C, the, which is the step correctness checker. And as inputs, it gets x, the step, and then a1 of x, a2 of x, a3 of x, the values of the, uh, regist at the registers at the beginning of the step, and uh, the values of the registers after the step. So that is all you need. Uh, if you know the program, that is all you need to verify the correctness of a single step. And it has to be 0. And um, yeah, we assume that this can be encoded as a polynomial. Uh, since the program is finite, this is always the case. Clear so far? Any questions? Who is already asleep? Good. Uh, there was graphics here, OK? That's, there's a table. <laughs> it has actual numbers. OK, let's continue. Um, so that's, again, a repetition of what we had in the bottom, the condition for computation being correct. Now, uh, something happens that's a simplification, but you might not think of it as a simplification. simplification. Let's see. So we have these three registers. And what we do, so we have three registers and one polynomial per register. And we combine these three polynomials into a single polynomial by just uh, kind of stretching it. So um, we call this single polynomial A, and so perhaps it's better to explain that on the table again. We build it such that A at 0 is this one here. This is A at 1, A at 3, A at 4, A at 5, A at 6, A at 7, and so on. So it's basically just encoding the whole table into a single sequence of values. And yeah, so and we need these. Uh, um, lowercase a's to perform the mapping between the indices here. So, and if we look at that and replace all the ai's by the single a, we get this here. So c of x, then a at the first index, a at the second index, a at the third index, and then a at the first index at x plus 1, second index at x plus 1, and third index at x plus 1. OK. Question? I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> when you execute the program and you have different values for the inputs, then you every time have a different polynomial, right? So, yeah, so the, every execution. this is stuff the prover has to do, and of course that has to be repeated for every single execution, yes. Okay. But once you executed the whole program and you interpolated the um, polynomial once you have the polynomial. So every, if you want, this is basically where you want to do it, so you don't have to run the whole program again. Exactly. So this is, so yeah, this is stuff the prover has to do, but that's stuff the verifier does not have to do. Right? So, and the idea is verifying the computation is faster than re-executing it, but generating the proof, of course, takes long, longer than just re-executing it or just executing it. Does that answer the question a little, or not yet? OK, I, I will 
I will have an overview of the whole protocol later. Perhaps it gets clear then. OK, and now, so what the statement here, that's a statement about a polynomial on the left-hand side and a number on the right-hand side. And it's a statement at 8,000 discrete points of this polynomial, 8,000 discrete input points of the polynomial. And what we now want to do to get it fully algebraic is to turn this into a statement not about discrete points, but a statement about two polynomials and statement about them being identical. And so, yeah, I'll just, okay. What we do is, um, so we say that the, the polynomial on the left-hand side here is zero at these points. And this means on the right-hand side, if you want to have a polynomial here at the right-hand side, we have to find a polynomial that is zero at these points. And that is this polynomial here. So the polynomial Z is zero at exactly the point zero, one, two, until seven, nine, 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 and nowhere else. And uh, if you just put Z here, then this will not capture the full polynomial here, so we need to add another polynomial factor. Or multiply. Um, a different explanation is we take this polynomial and it has some zeros. We know that it has zeros here. So uh, if we have a field that is algebraically co closed, like the complex number or a proper finite field, then we can factor out these factors, x minus zero. And if we do that, then these factors we removed are z and the rest is d. Question? Uh, yeah. So you're saying the polynomial C has an order that is uh, higher than uh, Z, obviously. But uh, like, how is it three times as uh, like the, the order, the number of the? Yes. Yeah, so the degree of C is higher than eight thousand because I mean, if you take a look at it, um, the degree of of a one is exactly eight thousand, yeah. and that's a argument of C, so, and it has more stuff, so it will probably okay. be higher. So is the question like three times as big? I don't know. I mean, it depends on the program, of course, how complex that program is. Okay. Perhaps 1,000 times. Okay. Yeah, but I don't know. Okay, and the, the important thing here is that, so we have the same left-hand side here and replace the zero by uh, a product of two polynomials. And now we can say that this equality is not only hold for all x in this discrete set, but for all x in the whole field. So we have actual polynomial identity everywhere. And because of that, we can apply the stuff we talked about earlier, checking equality of two polynomials by evaluating them at some points and checking that the value is the same. Um, yeah, right. So uh, all polynomials here have small degree, and small here means small in comparison to the size of the field. So the size of the field is something like 2 to the 80, and the degree of the polynomials is something like between 8,000 and 10 million or something like that. And this will be important later. Okay, now um, we've come until here and I see, still see some open eyes, that's great. Because now I will describe the full interactive protocol that is run now between prover and verifier. And as a reminder, uh, this is the property you want to show at the end. Okay, um, given. So this means this is a shared input that is available both to the prover and the verifier. C is available to, go to both because this is kind of encoded in the program. That's the, the function, the program they want to verify. Then these A1, A2, A3, these are simple uh, functions, 3x plus 2 or something like that. And then Z, that's the polynomial that has zeros exactly at the point 0, 1, 2, and so on. This is a polynomial of rather high degree, especially for the verifier, but it has a very simple structure. Okay, the prover now computes 
the polynomials A and D. These are gigantic beasts, and we do not want to send them to the verifier. Um, she computes A by basically running the computation and uh, looking at the values of the registers, running polynomial interpolation, and uh, yeah, that's how she gets A. And then D is obtained by evaluating this expression here and dividing it by Z using polynomial division or yeah, something like fast Fourier transform. There are quite efficient algorithms for that. And now um, the prover actually wants to send the full A and the full D to the verifier, but that is way too long. So we do something that is almost like sending the full thing to the verifier, and it's that this is creating a Merkle tree of all these 8,000, or yeah, of all these values, and sending the Merkle root to the verifier. Ah, yeah, actually, um, we have to evaluate A and D not only on these 8,000 points, but actually on way more. And the reason for that is uh, if we compare polynomials by evalu evaluating them at some points, and these, these points can only be points, can only be from this set of 8,000 points, then they will always match. So we have to evaluate the polynomials on way more points. Um, okay, always match, why? If you only evaluate these functions at 8,000 points and assume that they are degree 8,000, then to okay, two polynomials of degree 8,000 that are different can still be equal at 8,000 points. Because of that, we need way more than 8,000 points to get the right probability. So if the verifier is unlucky, she might hit one of these points where the different polynomials are actually equal. And, but if there are uh, one million points to choose from and only 8,000 are unlucky, then the probability is rather low. So we probably want to ramp that up to, to 10 million. Okay, that's a very large Merkle tree, uh, but it still seems to work. So um, yeah, what the verify now does, she requests, uh, so she, she picks a random X prime from these one million points and requests the values of the polynomials at these points. Uh, there's some weird notation here, and the reason is that um, the verifier requests, the, requests A and D to be evaluated. But if you look at this formula here, then it, the X prime doesn't directly go into A. It's first transformed via these uh, lowercase a functions, and this means we have to request, we have to first transform uh, this x prime by a1. That's actually wrong, this minus one shouldn't be there, right? Okay, um, and then the next step is the prover, of course, provides these values. Again, don't remove this minus one here, and uh, she provides these values together with a Merkle proof inside the Merkle tree where the, the root of which she sent earlier. And the verifier, of course, checks the, the Merkle proofs and also checks that, uh, yeah, basically this equation adds up uh, when, you in, when you insert the values that the prover just provided. Sorry. Yep. Where comes the randomness from? Um, in this model, we just assume that, I mean, this is still interactive. So it is, the model is much more powerful, it's interactive, and the verifier has randomness. Um, yeah, I don't have a slide for that because of reasons. Um, so I can talk about that now. Uh, the way you remove both interaction and randomness is similar, and uh, the reason is, so if you, if you take a close look then, everything the verifier sends to the prover is actually just a random number. So it's, it's just, I mean, the, the verifier could also just send this X prime and then check that the prover <coughs> computed these things correctly. So, and <clears throat> it is also important that this random number is public. So the, 
the, var the prover can have access to the random number because the prover pre-committed to the root of the Merkle tree. So, and if the prover first commits to the root of the Merkle tree and then gets the randomness, then she cannot modify the Merkle tree anymore. Um, and the way you remove both interaction and randomness now is you, so if it's non-interactive, then this means the prover just generates a single string, a single message, and then this is verified once on the blockchain, for example. And this means this message is basically everything that is sent to the prover as to the verifier, so the, the roots of the Merkle trees. And then um, to get randomness, you basically just evaluate a hash function on these two roots and take the randomness from there. Because this is the same thing. So if the prover first sends the Merkle roots and then receives the randomness, she cannot modify the Merkle root anymore. And if the, if the randomness just depends on the Merkle tree, then any modification in the Merkle tree would also change the randomness. But in the beginning, you said you just expect, when you talked about the assumptions, you just expect uh, collision resistance. And now all of a sudden, you expect uh, random oracle access from the hash function, right? There's much more to ask from the hash function. You know, in the beginning, the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Might be that I confused some terms here. So, but it's, is it enough if the hash function is um, uniformly distributed? I don't know. That's, I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it might be that you need to uh, assume stronger hash functions, but usually this is what should suffice. And just, there was another question, but let me just finish. Um, now we have this random number, and then the, the prover can just use that random number and continue, and provide that stuff, and then uh, perform this check. And now um, the verifier, which, and then this, this proof is complete. We send it to the blockchain, and the blockchain just uh, reruns the steps of the verifier, and that's how we remove both interaction randomness. Question. Um, I'm not whether you, I don't know whether you said it, um, but am I correct that the one million points or the more points of evaluating the polynomial are inside the interval of the 8,000? Because, or are they points outside the interval as well? Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter and it's actually not, I mean, these are finite fields, so there's no really a concept of inside or outside or smaller and larger. I mean, there, there is, but. There is no danger of polynomials going away on the, on the... Yeah, I mean, it's a finite field, so you don't get overflow problems or something like that. So you don't get problems with precision. That's what you're asking about, I guess. Mm, no, I'm kind of asking... Since you're evaluating a polynomial and the, um, um, the value of a point of polynomial, and I kind of... Is it possible for the, for the interpolation function of the polynomial to go away to... Um, infinity on the edges of the, board, uh, of the interval that you're computing? Uh, no, because the field is finite. So the, the values of the polynomials, polynomials are always elements of a finite field. Question? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a stupid question now, but I, I was talking about the non-determinism of evaluating the polynomial, but it's answered by the finite field. Okay, okay. Right. I mean, so I have a mathematical problem, problem in if, if, there would be, if you would want to repeat the proof across multiple proofs um, or different architectures there, in evaluating the polynomial itself. I mean, the computation has to be properly defined to be a mathematical thing without any means of variability or. Yeah, yeah but I, I think the answer is, then, as you said, it's a finite view. Yeah, uh, that's good. Well. Oh yeah, and another thing of using hash function for randomness, of course, is that this thing gets put into the stick, which is also important for various reasons. Okay, um, what is missing from here? I actually said it on the first slide, if someone still remembers. <coughs> Privacy. What? Privacy. <laughs> uh, yeah, that we can stuff it on top. That's. Ah, that is. 
Yes, so we just said that the, that the polynomial is a proof that the polynomial is of small size, so small degree, I guess. Can we? Yeah. And why is that important? Yeah, so because otherwise the, the prover can just, I mean, the prover computes this A and creates a Merkle tree of the values, and these values can just be anything. They, doesn't, they don't have to be. So just, just from the Merkle root, you don't really see whether the values are the values of a polynomial. And if they are not the values of a polynomial, we lose this property that two different functions are different at almost all points. Okay, so, yeah, ah, yeah that's the question. Um, the IOPP will solve that, and yeah, the, as I already said, the prover can cheat unless A and D are polynomials of low degree, and low degree in this case is 8,000. Um, and the interactive oracle proof of proximity will help us. I will actually give a very simplified uh, presentation of IOPP, especially we will just ignore the proximity part. Um, in our simplified version, we have a Merkle tree of the values of a function, and we want to prove that uh, this function is a polynomial of degree at most d. We actually don't care which polynomial, and that's also important. The, the prover doesn't have to prove that this, is a, that this A is a certain polynomial. Uh, she just needs to prove that it's some polynomial. And uh, if we do it properly, then we add, so we add, if we add this proximity thing, then we actually show that it's either a polynomial of degree at most d, or it's uh, far away from all polynomials of degree d. And far away here means it differs at many points, at many values. Uh, but that's a little bit more complicated, so we'll do the simpler thing. And the main idea, so we will also, this will also be an interactive protocol because inside an interact, interactive protocol, we can invoke another interactive protocol as a subroutine. And the main idea is divide and conquer here. So we, what we do is, so we assume, of course, that F is a polynomial. So it has, uh, it's a sum of uh, coefficients times x to the power of k. And um, we take these powers of k and regroup them into odd and even uh, ones in the following way. So we have our polynomial f of x, and we state that it's equal to g of x squared. These are the uh, even uh, coefficients, plus x times h of x squared. These are the odd coefficients. And then g and h are, again, polynomials, but the d degree is d half now. It's d half because uh, the input is already x squared. Is it clear that that is possible? So we just move all even uh, coefficients to the left, group them, and interpret them as expressions in x squared instead of x and move all odd to the right, uh, factor out 1x, and also interpret them as uh, coefficients in x squared. And what is also important that the domain size, so that the domain is always a finite field, and this is also half, because uh, we only have uh, squares here. Okay? And now what we do is Again, the prover commits to a Merkle tree of all values of g and h, and the verifier requests a random check that this equality actually holds. We already have the prover already committed to all values of x. She does the same for g and h, and then we just evaluate this equality at a single point, at a single random point. And uh, so we know that this actually holds with high probability, and now we do the same thing recursively for g and h, but now the degree is only d half. And 
This recursion will terminate at some point where the degree is one, at which point, where the, at, and at that point, or it's zero, and at that point, the verifier can just check that by looking at it. Exactly. So the, the only randomness the verifier requests is just so uh, the randomness doesn't depend on any previous messages. That's also important. It's just a random number in a certain range. Any random number, uh, it's achieved in the same way. Exactly. Okay, we're almost through. Um, so the exciting part, the next talk is not far away. Um, how do we add zero knowledge? That is also simplified again because we ignore the fact that this, this proximity thing. Um, what is zero knowledge? Uh, there have been, so you can have a different talk about the whole concept of zero knowledge. A very simple explanation is that in such an interactive protocol, the prover convinces the verifier about the fact that the computation is true without revealing anything else about the computation. So in our specific example, the verifier never learns these intermediate values in the computation. Of course, the verifier is, yeah, it's a bit more, so that since the verifier can actually compute these intermediate values, this is not really true here. So the actual concept is a bit more complex because you can add hidden inputs. But yeah, let's take a look at Sudoku. For example, uh, there's an interactive protocol for Sudoku where I can prove to you that I know that this Sudoku is solvable without you actually lear learning the actual solution. I can't do it now but because I don't know the solution, but <laughs> there is a protocol that does that. So uh, at the end, you're convinced that it is solvable without knowing how to solve it. Okay, and how does it work uh, with Starks? Or actually, so I, we will only look at the zero knowledge aspect of this IOPP, and not at the Starks, uh, the, the full Stark zero knowledge. Um, so again, the task is uh, to show that these two polynomials A and D are arbitrary low degree polynomials. I said that before. It doesn't. We don't want to know. <coughs> we don't want to convince the verifier that they are have a speci they are specific polynomials. It just suffices to show that they are arbitrary polynomials of a certain maximum degree. And so uh, if we say that P is the set of all polynomials of degree at most D, then the following is true. Um, for any polynomial U in P, so for any polynomial of degree at most D, and any function F, F is in P if and only if F plus U is in P. The reason is, uh, so if f is a polynomial of degree at most d, then adding a polynomial of degree at most d will not yield a polynomial with higher degree. And uh, if f plus u has degree at most d, then you can subtract u. Um, and this will yield f, and of course, a polynomial with degree at most d minus a polynomial with degree at most d yields a polynomial with degree at most d. Good, um, and we use that now to show how we can get an IOPP with zero knowledge. And uh, yeah, we will almost show that. There's some tiny point that doesn't really work out. Um, the prover chooses, so we want to show that A is a polynomial with degree at most D. And, but what we do is instead, the prover uses randomness here and chooses a random polynomial with a degree at most D and adds it to A. And then creates the Mercury of values for A plus U. And then both run the IOPP for A prime. And the thing is now, since U was chosen uh, uniformly at random from P, 
this a prime is actually just a random polynomial of degree at most d. And the, the verifier cannot deduce anything about a from that. Um, yeah. Is that clear, more or less? And yeah, it, it works because of this lemma here. Um, ah, right. Uh, again, something I forgot. Uh, of course, the prover still has to convince the verifier that this equality here holds. And this is the kind of small hole here in the zero knowledge thing. Uh, because for that, we again have to evaluate them at a random point. And because of that, the uh, verifier learns at least a single point of A. Um, actually, the verifier also learns the root hash of the values of A. Um, but in the full stock construction, this so the reason why this doesn't matter in the full stock construction is that uh, it has a property that if you learn uh, up to t bits of the proof for a certain small constant t, you learn nothing about the the actual witness. And this is because of that you can. It actually is fine to evaluate this at one point. Uh, this will not yield anything about the actual thing the proof is about. Okay, I don't have any more slides. Are there questions? So you bring up uh, the start for the argument because they are less talked about um, than the times. But they also what? because you less talked about than the they, they get less attention than you, you, you make the anecdote. Uh, but do you think that they are more applicable to Ethereum than the smart? Um, Actually, it's the opposite. So uh, snarks are already possible in Ethereum because we have these precompiles, and also because the proofs are only 800, uh, 188 bytes, which, is, which fits easily into a transaction. And for Starks, we have proofs of size, uh, I don't know, 500 kilobytes, which is way too large for a transaction. So um, I could think of a specialist blockchain that only has Starks, where 500 kilobytes is not that large, because we have one megabyte blocks in Bitcoin. Um, but I don't think it's practical for Ethereum at the current point in time. Are there, sorry, uh, are there benefits to Starks? Oh, uh, yeah, the benefits of Starks are no trusted setup. Um, they are quantum resistant. Um, what else did I say? Yeah, uh, yeah, quantum resistant, uh, transparent. I mean, that means no trusted setup, and that's about it. Yeah. And they also they they don't make any unproven assumptions. So, uh, I mean, crypto assumptions does not only mean not quantum resistant, but I mean. Snarks assume this knowledge of exponent uh, thingy, which might just turn out to be not true. Uh, so set up for the one property and for the transparency of the setup. The question was where the setup for the run once thing and the transparent is the same? Yes, it is the same. Oh, okay. So just the initial setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in Snarks, the, there's an initial setup that generates a certain amount of data, and that data is then reused for every single transaction to verify every single transaction. Yep. Um, and in the case you have stocks, uh, but they need a trusted setup. Uh, I know at least one of our scheme, but also has most properties. And everything else is the shared sham here, so it's going to be longer because you make many challenges, right? And do you think it's possible to have both, uh, to ever have a concise scheme that doesn't have a trusted setup? Is there a so you're saying uh, Starks are mainly longer because they have interaction and because of Fiat Shamir and the Merkle proofs, the proofs are longer? Yeah. Um, I mean, Eli Ben Sasson is confident that uh, that can be considerably improved. I don't have that much insight, so I hope. <laughs> yeah. 
there a compiler way for starters? Uh, there are implementations on GitHub for the whole thing. Um, I'm not sure what the actual input is, but they, um, it's not as, so snarks, uh, for snarks you usually have to create uh, arithmetic circuits and then compile them. And for starks, uh, they start with register machines. So they actually use computation traces. And the paper says that uh, it is better to run on register machines than create uh, arithmetic circuits. Because when you start with arithmetic circuits, you end up with polynomials of degree two. And this is important for snarks because they can only handle polynomials of degree two. But Starks can handle polynomials with higher degree. And if you start with computation traces, you get polynomials of degree eight. And because of that, it's more efficient than going through circuits. Yep. Uh, just out of curiosity, I know that quantum computers are a far away. I mean, I think they can do 50 qubits now in that universities. But once you decide for one of them, say for snarks, and uh, we get the quantum computer, can you change the snarks? Because then the whole thing breaks down, right? So I'm not really up to date, but I doubt that they can handle 50 qubits. I thought very unstable. Unsta right, so there might be, so there's so, in, in popular articles, they usually say quantum computers, but, but actually there are two vastly different types of quantum computers. And one of them is adiabatic quantum computers, and they cannot break uh, discrete logarithm. Uh, they can just do some optimization problems probably quite fast, but actually there's not no real theory about that. And I think those have 40, uh, 50 qubits, and the others I think might have 10 or something like that. And so the number of qubits you need is basically the, the key size. If you have a, quanti a full quantum computer with a key size up to your private key, then you can recover that just from a public key. Um, whether you can switch from snarks to starks, I mean, they are fundamentally different things, but if you build your system flexible enough, then of course you can switch. I mean, yeah. And I mean, if you start with a system like Ethereum, then you can have smart contracts and I can have both at the same time. If Starks, if either the EVM is uh, performant enough to implement Starks or Starks are improved as much as such that they are, can be run on the EVM. Okay, then uh, sorry for boring you <laughs> for an hour and thanks for your attention.